there's been a lot of talk about the social justice in the fashion and apparel production industry. So there's been a lot of discussion going on for about two decades, and I'm going to focus my presentation today on why things are not changing. Well, we're talking about it a lot. I went on ahead and I examined all of the literature on the subject. And <laughs> when I tell you that was quite a few years in the making, um, I'm probably understating it because so many disciplines are studying the apparel trade, that being one of the largest trades in the world um, as far as industrial sectors. And everybody was noting that there's issues with, fi with fast fashion. I know that things are getting worse from year to year because I keep track of the industry and I'm looking at the record sales from year to year despite global recession, despite all the academic discussion on social justice and environmental justice in the field. Every quarter there's record sales. So these are just some of the titles that you see up here from leading business publications that are tracking the retail sales of the leading fast fashion retailers. We're all talking about it but nobody knows what to do because now there's whole this discipline that talks about corporate social responsibility and even the professionals in that discipline are giving you misguiding statements about we don't know what's going on, why things are bad, the consumers don't, go, don't know what's going on, but actually they do. And it's time that the story was told. We started in the late 90s with no logo of Naomi Klein that talked about the brand and retailers and the fact that they're charging you a lot of money for logos and how unjust and inequitable their production platforms are. There was um, textbooks written on competition in the fashion industry. Those are the burn bomb examples. And my favorite, the latest, which is Overdressed, which was just released two years ago, that talked about the waste associated with textile production. Have you all heard of this movie? It was just released this summer. We communicate who we are through clothes. So pay attention to it, the trailer, and tell me what you think of the major message. We used to have a system, a fashion system. That has absolutely nothing to do with the fashion industry today. It has been reinvented. It's based on materialism. The problem is that comes at a really high price. factory collapsed, killing more than 1,000. Clashes between clothes factory workers and riot police in Canberra. Last November, 112 people were killed in another major factory fire. 30,000 factory workers in Bangladesh were paying the price for cheap clothing. Well, the promise of globalization was that it was going to be a win-win, that consumers in the rich world would get cheaper goods and people in the poorer parts of the world would get jobs, and that those jobs would give them an opportunity to work their way out of poverty. This enormous, rapacious industry that is generating so much profit, why is it that it is unable to support millions of its workers properly? The actual business model is completely unsustainable. Unless you change that model, you can't change anything. When everything is concentrated on making profits, what you see is that human rights, the environment, workers' rights, get lost. My God, we can do better than this. the main message that you get from that trailer? What do you think? The first, the first thing that pops into your head. What's the main message? Thanks, Chad. Go ahead. Sorry. There are a lot of hidden costs. Hidden costs. All of the research focuses on the labor issues, inequality, exploitation. But take a look at this pricing sheet. Where's labor up there? 6%. It's part of CMT. T used to be incorporated in there, but now fashion is so plastics contingent that trim uh, zippers, toggles, rhinestones, now are a lot more expensive than they used to be. So labor is even incorporated in that smallest of percent. What are the largest value-adding links in that pricing sheet? Fabric is the first one, right? We all define the quality of whatever you're wearing through the fabric. And afterwards, 
all added together, over 30% in relation to the small 6% is probably 4% in labor, is transporting that fabric around the world. Now, you don't have to be an MBA in international business to know that when the indirect cost of shipping cargo around the world are five times the amount of labor, labor is not your competitive advantage factor. So we're going to talk about today why do we have this platform that all of this transportation needs to go places, not just any place, certain places. It's because of something we call in the industry environmental sourcing. So environmental sourcing happens because the apparel industry is the second largest consumer of water after agriculture. It is very water intensive. It's not just the second largest consumer, it is the first polluter. It is so inefficient, the production of that fabric that defines our clothing at 13%. It's so inefficient when it comes to effluent treatment that the production of one ton of fabric pollutes about 200 tons of water beyond any use of human or ecological safe standards that exist out there. Now we're going to talk about why that is happening, and this is unfortunately the legacy of schools like ours and other material science universities that focus their legacy in the invention and innovation in the production of affordable quality fabric, affordable being the key component. We wanted to make fabric cheap. So fabric is an interesting thing. Most of it today is made out of natural fibers because polyester apparently did such a damage to the psyche of the consumer that you can't sell anything today and call it fashion if it's made from polyester. Thank you, 70s. And that actually comes from an insider in the business that studies straight dynamics and says, why is polyester not popular when it's so much better for the environment? Because the 70s damaged the consumer beyond reason. So we have an entire system that depends on the production of natural fibers, and most of fashion today is produced out of cotton. So cotton needs to go through certain chemical processes in order to turn into fabric, because the natural fibers, as you probably know a little bit from uh, your agricultural export courses, are not really that, um, they don't come out like this, right? Cotton is not like that. So the first one is the spinning. And I've um, taken up some images from our friends at Texas Tech who brag on the technology that they have invented. And I'm going to tell you about the processes that go through the processing of bale cotton. So the first one is spinning in which the yarn is actually spun. This is what the equipment looks like. And I want you to pay attention to the, how much do you think those things cost, those big machines, right? Um, spinning is the least, is the only dry process and is the least environmentally damaging. It's really damaging for the workers that work into the factories because they're very loud. Spinning is a very loud process. But then we go into what we call the wet processing. And the first one of the wet processing is called singeing. So singeing is done so you can kill the bacteria in cotton. Right? And it's then at high temperatures. And there's regulations that tell you what is the maximum hot water that you can dump into an open river basin or a water basin around the textile factory. And the guideline is about 40 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, every piece of research that I've looked at says the actual singeing influence are at those levels. So pretty much any water around a textile factory is boiling every day. Right? So that's pretty bad. Oh, it doesn't stop there. Then we have to size the fabric, which is more heating processes in which these particular links need to happen in order to make it pliable. All right, sizing, pretty bad, pretty bad. That, again, that hot polluted water needs to be dumped somewhere. Then we have scouring, and that is one of the first chemical processes in which you actually add things to the fabric to make it even more usable and more, um, more fine, right? Size, the scouring is um, a very intense process that it has some pretty toxic components associated with it. And again, it's slightly regulated by what we call biological oxygen demand effluence. And there's guidelines for those set up in international trade by the World Trade Organization. It doesn't stop there. Then we're going to bleach it. I don't even have to explain what bleaching is, but you know it's really toxic. I just want to show you a bleaching machine. And in case you want to buy one, there you go. You can order from the good people of China. So after it's bleached, though, modern day cotton needs to be mercerized. And this is one of the new innovations in textile production that we are so proud of. Mercerizing cotton 
is explained up there. But what it allows you to do is come up with those poly blends that we all love and the combination of natural and artificial fibers that make our clothes so much nicer, so much finer, so much easier to dye. And they also step fast the dyes. The dyes stay on the fabric much better after it's mercerized. So when mercerizing was almost not done before the advent of fast fashion and poly blends about 20 years ago, now it's one of the most important processes in fabric production and in fabric innovation. And then we come to the ugliest of all truths. These are the standards today in modern dyeing of fabric. So we know it's really polluting, like any dyeing process is. But the technology to make that fabric not bleed in your wash, to make the dyes stick to the fibers, is so inefficient that these are the averages that you see up there. About 15% of the industrial production of all dyes in the world is lost, washed away, during the dyeing of fabric. There's 72 toxic elements identified in the process, and only a, a percent of them, 40, can be slightly mitigated through purification methods, but not removed. The other toxic elements are not subject to regulation. Surprising. So the regulatory problem is that if those elements cannot be treated through purification, they're not regulated. So that means free for all. The international regulatory body, the World Trade Organization, only tracks certain pollutant levels, and that's BOD values, which stands for biological oxygen demand, which is an overall pollution metric of effluents. And by effluents, I mean the industrial waters that are expelled into an open water basin, that are taken into industrial production, could be of textiles, could be of plastics, could be of steel, and they have to be discharged somewhere. So unfortunately, the worst and most toxic, what we call trace elements, the heavy metals and the carcinogens like mercury, are not detectable in BOD levels because they're only detectable in tests that are called total suspended solid tests and total dissolvable solid tests. But those tests are not conducted because it's prohibitively cost ineffective for one thing. For another thing, it's you can't really trace them and say that they were emitted now. They could have been in the soil as trace elements for 50 years. And they could be surfacing now because of soil mobility. That's one of the reasons why in our area, on the Akushnet River, where I used to live in one of the converted textile buildings, the EPA is there on daily basis testing for pollution levels that are a legacy of hundreds of years of textile production and those carcinogens being emitted and being absorbed into the groundwater and then moved into the soil level. There's not an adequate regulatory system that tracks pollution. That's why pollution is happening. So this is the end result. And you can see images like that, particularly in this day and age, in um, NGO websites and on people who do investigative reporting on textile pollution and that has gained a lot of um, prominence in the media. And, you, and they tell you entire ecosystems are being destroyed. So again, a couple of examples of the people who really do investigation, it's usually in Asia, and there's one statistic about the Bangladesh industry that is absolutely mind-boggling, that out of 20,000 mills, 50 to 100 have good regulatory compliance, and that means that they're reporting their BOD values, and that country is part of the research that I do, and it's not like they're cleaning their water, they're just telling you how polluted they are. Um, Greenpeace does the best investigative reporting on it and you can go on their website and get all the reports and actually read what's happening in textile manufacturing internationally. Uh, but they have been beating that drum since 2011. And as I just showed you, there's 2015 releases that are saying, okay, we've been talking about this for decades, things are getting worse. Why are things getting worse? If you haven't heard of Luke Wong, he won a prestigious National Geographic Award in 2008 when he actually illegally took pictures of water pollution in China. Um, and he focused the pictures on the fact that the water pollution is not something just affecting wildlife, but he focused on the human cost. He went into villages known as cancer villages to look at birth defect rates and cancer rates in children, took really disturbing pictures, and that got people talking to the point that the Chinese government actually 
is beginning to acknowledge the fact that pollution from textile and chemical plants is their largest water polluter, uh, is water problem, but the way that they're dealing with it is that they're just dumping the toxins into <coughs> open international waters at this point because unfortunately, there's no purification methods that are viable and economically able to be implemented in order to, um, to help anything. So this is another picture of actual pollution being pumped into the Yellow Sea, and you can see the dead fish floating. So uh, think of how your tuna tastes now when you look at these pictures. So, but again, that is not the majority of images that you see. You hear people about me talk about it, but not really explaining the issue and always putting the blame on the producer, like they can do something about it. They gotta clean up their mess, right? It's not my problem. Because we have these counter images that are telling us how wonderful textile production is for us. So they come from the people who make most money in textile production, and those are the producers of natural fibers. So the textile consumption has grown to such levels that we're just gonna give you a few examples. Where historically the US, the largest exporter of cotton, which is the main fabric in fashion apparel, has exported about 5,000 bales a year, right, at the most. And the recent past, it's tripled, if not quadrupled, that export amount. Now that's really good for politicians that are fighting the trade deficit. What other industry do you know that's quadrupled its exports, right? So, of course, they're extremely proud of this, and they have a big industrial body supporting those interests. We have about 25 registered cotton farmers that are generating this wonder for American exports, and the government makes sure that they're very well supported in subsidies. So one cotton farmer gets about $2 million a year just for growing cotton before making a profit on selling the cotton. That's more welfare than a lot of small towns are given to their most needy. Those are multi-millionaires, who love to vote against the government, by the way, but that's another presentation. So, and they're always boasting that they have that consumption overseas that is driving the demand and we gotta give them money so they gotta undercut the uh, international competition and sell at competitive <coughs> prices, right? And these are their biggest customers. But this is the truth. The cotton doesn't stay there, it comes back. Almost all of the American cotton that gets exported gets re-imported back, okay? Based on three major policies. One is the product sharing rule of the US Import Code, which states that any good that comes from what, or gets 40% of its value from a US input is not subject to duties or tariffs when it's re-imported into the country. So that creates an incentive for overseas mills that have customers that sell their products in American retailers to make sure they keep, they keep a nice paper trail of American cotton coming into those mills. Not Pakistani, not Indian, not Chinese, not African, American. Because then they get that special preferential treatment when they have to import the product back into the United States, right? So the second policy that is supporting this product sharing rule, well the first one is the export support, we talked about it, but the structural adjustment loan programs of the World Bank is incentivizing poor countries to attract investment, foreign investment. And the more foreign investors go into a country, the better success that program is seen to have. So the system of support of exporting that cotton to process it toxically into textiles somewhere to re-import it back into the United States is created such a system that there's bodies of literature on Kuznets curves and an equal ecological exchange talking about it. But see, that's the problem with us academics. We talk to each other, right? And this, we've been talking about this for decades, that the poorest of countries are under most pressure to get these structural adjustment loans, and in those countries there's evidence for very dangerous pollution metrics because those governments are choosing to attract investors by saying, hey, you don't have to come in here and pay the cost of regulation, or if your industry is such as the textile industry that there's no technology to help you clean up your mess, it's okay, just come on over. But this is what the consumer sees. Low prices, choice, glamour. And look at these prices, look at these product lines. From $1.80, what can you buy for $1.80? Clothes, apparently, right? 
We'll give you $5 for a shirt? Come on, it's awesome. And who's telling us that this is okay? People that we trust. We don't have fashion models anymore. We have spokespersons, we have celebrity models, and those celebrity models have their own environmental cash. So, for example, up here, we know Madonna is always performing at Live Earth and supports poverty allevi alleviation in Africa. Mrs. Brady there, Giselle Bündchen, she is an ambassador for the UN Environment Program and sits on um, the board of the Rainforest Alliance and in a recent editorial talks about how it's just such an environmentalist, right? So when she puts her name on something, the consumer never thinks that she's promoting a polluting product. And my favorite, the lady over there, Olivia Wilde, who was one of the biggest and most vocal critics of fast fashion, when she became so uncomfortable, she got signed by H&M to promote their conscious collection. So let's talk about what exactly is a conscious collection. Well, it's one product line out of, I don't know, 150 that are replenished on every 30 days with new product. But it talks about this whole eco-textile movement, eco-fashion. Have you heard of eco-fashion before? Hands, show me, right. And you've already accepted it that there's such a thing? Hands, that it doesn't cause any environmental damage, that's why it's called eco-fashion? Hands, good, no hands, well you know better. There's no such thing as eco-fashion. Because eco-fashion gets its branding from using recycled product, which is good, but we're gonna talk about why that's commercially not really a viable solution. Um, it talks about organic. Organic is nice, but farm level costs are about 6% fiber production. We just went through the chemical processes that have to happen to that organic cotton for it to turn into this. Whether it's organic or not, does not matter once you singe it, size it, mercerize it, bleach it, and dye it. Very nice, but it's not problem solved. But the consumer loves the idea. Oh, I can, I can buy something that's called eco-fashion, and problem solved. Okay. But is it really? No, not really. And why? Because we have standards that are nebulous. So this is the leader in organic fashion certification. It is what is we're referred to as a non-governmental body of voluntary compliance. We call it voluntary code of conduct entity. That's Ecotex. So this is what they test for. Oh, stuff that's legally testable for. Um, if it's not legally testable for, we're working on making sure that the consumer knows if there's any toxicity associated with the product that's dangerous to them when they wear it. Not to the environment when it's produced. If it's toxic to the consumer when they put it on their body. Hmm. Okay. So let's see how people are falling for this. Head over heels. Ecotex. Fascinating. Everybody loves it. Big designers are putting out Ecotex certified product lines. Don't even get me started on what is the, that one with Gucci? Zero deforestation handbag. That means nothing. The largest exporter of leather is America because we're the largest producer of cattle and there's no rainforest in America to be cut down. So yes, there's some being NGO talk about a uh, portion of the Amazon rainforest being cut down for cattle, but by Gucci saying, oh, that's okay, now we're just going to get our letter from the American cattle farmers, that doesn't mean that the environment is not being destroyed. Okay, so, uh, but we have Ecotech certified product lines that are being launched, and here we go, this green challenge by a friend, Tom Ford who just is now dressing celebrities on the red carpet, raising awareness, asking you to buy Ecotech certified clothing. But yet, yeah, this is the reality, right? This is an editorial from Newsweek from two weeks ago exposing the fact that, that this is a bunch of hokey. Nothing is really changing, things are getting worse. The latest report from Greenpeace shows that we're talking, all of this eco-fashion talk is out there. And we have all these retailers, tellers that they're sen selling environmentally friendly clothing, but the production is actually not changing. And I wanted to show you those two screenshots because this is from a documentary that French National Television conducted last year on the Conscience Collection production facilities of H&M. 
they went to the place where the conscious collection is made. And would you guess where that was? The Rana Plaza Industrial Complex that you all know from that tragedy that we saw in the documentary. So what they saw that the only thing that was changed in the production reality was armed guards at every point showing away photographers. And they took pictures of a school less than a kilometer away, which is less than a half mile away, where the textile chemicals were being pumped into the schoolyard. And as they're over there looking at the effluents being pumped into the schoolyard, the school administrator or directors coming out, calling the armed guards, saying, sir, you better get down here. They're foreigners and they're filming. An hour-long documentary that made me absolutely shiver then tracks not just Bangladesh but goes to Ethiopia where the new facilities are and then talks to all the decision makers of H&M pretty much for them to tell you that it's out of their hands because they have cost limits that they need to meet and unfortunately this is the reality of technological advancement in textile production that they're doing everything in compliance. Unfortunately, compliance doesn't go far enough to do it any kind of major change. Why is that the case? Because all of that discussion and all of these documentaries are watched by adults. But we don't matter. Because in the last 20 years, the main fashion demographic has completely changed. Where it used to be females that were wage earners and they drove the fashion market, today it's children. They're the non-wage earners. And it's not just females, but it's men as well. So they really don't know about this. Nobody talks to them about this. And we're going to go over the literature that tracks that. But just to show you how important of a target market they are, I'm just going to show you a few statistics. So teens today spend five times as much on apparel as their parents did. And they're the fashion decision makers of their family. Okay. So how important and how much money are we talking here? And by the way, it's very disturbing to me that an entire academic discipline in advertising and apparel promotion has such a negative and derogatory term towards their main fashion demographic as the naggers. Just to show you the condescending attitude, we all know that young people like to go to the mall. Apparently, the retail people track how much they go to the mall, and they tell us they go to the mall twice a week in institutionalized group outings with friends, and they spend an average of $50 on apparel. On average, that varies on those two outings a week, right? That's called habitual consumption. When you shop for pleasure, not for utility, you go to the mall, you hang out, oh, and you buy a frock, two, whatever, you have an allowance, this is what your allowance is for. Because that's what your friends are doing, and that's what your parents do to get you out of their hair. So it's good, malls are safe, they're police, they're patrol. My 12 year old is fine at the mall for a couple hours with her friends. Here's 50 bucks. All right. But then, they're also socializing the fact that they need to look a certain way when they're with their friends. And we all know about back to school shopping, but you have to see this. This is, this is from the National, uh, American National Retail Federation. This is what you spend on back to school shopping. About $700 per child, 400 of that on clothing. That's on top of that 50 bucks a week that they spend on clothing anyway. So, the global retail market, when I was looking at this literature from the mid 2000s, said the retail market was about $1.5 trillion. Then I'm looking at these latest numbers and I'm like, I'm, I mean, I'm not a math genius, but it's got to be a lot more than that. If we spend 80% of it in just one week, how much money are we talking here? How much profit is there to be made in this field? It's absolutely mind boggling. So, NGOs like the National Parent Association do research and they tell you actually talk to the people who give money to the naggers. It's like, is this really true? Do you really give them that much money? How much money are you spending on your kids? This is what they're finding in some of their studies. Nine out of ten moms, they say they spend more on their, uh, on their children's fall wardrobe than their own. Like, your kids have a fall wardrobe? We had a hand-me-down wardrobe when I was a kid. Now they have a fall wardrobe. Of course they do. And as much as we're talking about... Uh, all of that social convention, you just have to see our friend Tom Ford's latest collection just released in which he embraces new media and says, I'm going to buy, bypass Fashion Week and I'm just going to put my collection up online. And I want you to take a look at the collection and see who it caters to. 
talks about sustainable fashion, the need to recycle, and then look what he puts out on the shelves. So you're going to pay attention to two things, the clothes and the models. And it's a hot song. That's Lady Gaga, by the way. The old one. So, we, we've always had young models. But these people are so young. It looks like Grandma Gaga chaperoning a junior high prom. When you look at the clothes, there's not a stitch in that collection that is recycled or recyclable. They're all composites from chiffon to jersey to most exclusively lame, which cannot be recycled, right? Cannot be Ecotex certified, but it doesn't matter because we have to appear to the youth demographic. When it comes to the design, fashion bases its design skill on the silhouette, which mean curves. What curves? There's not a bra in sight in this collection except on Lady Gaga. So this is the youth demographic that must buy the clothes. That clothes are designed for people who haven't developed, who have no silhouette, who have no curves. And that's why when all of that Ecotex discussion goes out the window, and the only thing that matters is appealing to your main demographic. So. There's an entire literature to tell you how to sell to these people. They have terminology that describes what a successful modern retailer is. They embrace the business model of impulse buying. Okay? The retail tactic of impulse buying is an on-site overstimulation. Could be in the store, could be online through such sexy videos. That just makes you want to buy right now. The goal is unplanned purchases. Unplanned purchases. Underscore. Unplanned purchases. You had no idea before you went into the store that you were going to buy this. Overstimulation. Strategy. Low prices. This only works if the prices are so low that the biggest problem in fashion retail that has always plagued fashion retail has been buyer remorse. Returning your crap after you wear it for a few days. If it's so cheap that there's no buyer remorse, there's no rationality. So the ideal consumer, and this is verbatim from the literature, from body after body of successful retail management literature, the ideal consumer, consumer is an impulsive, insecure, neurotic, irrational millennial. Oh, better, better. Why is that the case? Because of the stealth approach in advertising, what we just talked about. They have celebrity spokesmodel who stand for a product that you don't know what the product means, but you know the celebrity is a good person. So in your mind, there's no connection between injustice, pollution, and the product that you're buying because it's not your problem because you have this spokesperson with an environmental cash telling you that it's okay. Why is that the case? Because it, there's the finding from there from the literature. They're unsophisticated and irrational consumers of advertising, which means they don't understand what's being advertised to them. And that is very successful because they like awareness of the product features. I didn't know, I was in the industry and I was not quite sure about the technologies in, mo in modern fiber production. I just knew they were bad, but not that they were that bad. So how is the 12 year old supposed to know what they're wearing as a poly blend is ecologically damaging? And then that's the case because they don't care. They have been socialized in this concept that the retail literature describes as habitual consumption earlier than all other generations, which means nothing matters until 
nothing matters but the price, really, and going and taking part of that habitual consumption. So this was tested and tried by fast fashion retailers, but now in America, those are not the largest consumers of textile products. These are the new guys on the block. People don't really buy clothes at the mall anymore. I mean, they do, but only certain people and to a certain extent. What's growing right now is we buy clothes in these places we never used to. If you ever bought clothes at Kmart when I was young, in the 90s, and you told your friends, well, you would be laughed at. But now, these are the largest consumer of product sharing rule, American made textile imports in the United States. I remember the first time I heard of Kohl's. I was already out of the industry. I didn't know what a Kohl's was. My mother told me about it. I remember when Target first opened, we called it Target. Oh, so great. So now American Apparel, American Eagle is going out of business. Gap is downsizing. All the traditional retailers are struggling because now you buy clothes here. Because this is where impulse buying is so important. You go through Costco. Oh, jeans. Hey, these are not bad jeans. Oh, shoes. Oh, great. Three bucks. Awesome. So this is the reality. This comes from uh, an NGO that actually tracks how apparel trade in America has grown in relation to how much of it is produced in the United States, how much is imported or re-imported, but mainly how much we consume. So on average, we buy one new piece of clothing a week. Do you? Did you buy a new piece of clothing last week? Week before? Don't lie to me. Let me ask you this, who went to Target this week? Okay. Who went to Target last week? How many times have you gone to Target for a greeting card and bought clothing without thinking that you were going to? Impulse purchasing. Mega successful, that's what we consume as much as we consume. So, just to show you how successful in terms of economic, overall economic activity is, this comes from a registry of textile producers that tell you how much their industry has grown. What do you notice about that cutting red line and that growth trajectory that is so crazy in the last few years? The Great Recession? Where? Not in textiles. Our consumption of textile is growing like crazy despite the greatest global recession in modern economic history. What on earth is going on? That's how successful this low price, impulse buying business model is. It leads to consumption of unprecedented levels. And we're just scratching the surface. We're scratching the surface because the largest growth potential is in emerging markets. When we consume in the developing, in the developed world, particularly in the United States, when we consume about one and a half trillion dollars of apparel, China, that is the fastest growing market, and you can see their growth potential right now. So 300 million people consume one trillion dollars worth of clothing. Now we have a country of 1.3 billion, and this is what they're buying right now. So guess what we need to be doing? Making sure that they're well dressed. And look at the ads, look at the look at the business model we're exporting to those countries. Is the retail model of successful commerce. Young people, low prices. So the situation is that dire. I really don't have any good news. So my editor was like, so what can we do? What give me something to work with? I said, I don't have any good news. I have bad news because we have invested decades of technology that makes cheap fabric. We didn't invest decades in technology that makes clean fabric. There is no substitution for mercerizing. There isn't any. And even if you go with dyes that are ecologically safer, they're not steadfast. They wash away. You have to have carcinogens, heavy metals, lead, copper in the dye so they can stick to the fabric. There's no two ways about it. The only thing you can do is buy less and not fall for gimmicks. So when I hear organic, I bristle. I'm so glad when I found that meme. I was like, I'm going to put it up there. Because organic is really not solving the problem. It is just another retail tactic to sell you more crap. 
When you say recycle, recycling technologies are just as polluting as new, new growth, we call them new growth technologies. And recycling can only improve a garment about, they say about 30%. If, let's say that you have a garment that's made with recycled cotton. Only 30% of the cotton can be recycled because singeing and mercerizing damage the fabric, so you have to reweave the yarn with new growth in order to make it pliable again. And you can only recycle it once. Polyblends, which is what Tom Ford's collection was made out of, not recyclable. Polyester, great. You can melt it, make it into a plastic bag, but apparently you people won't buy it. So we can put polyester up on the shelves. So I really have no good news. But I can talk about the problem for days.